Just to kind of put a little bit of the challenge that we all face in, in context in, in numbers. So going back to the uh, Ella MacArthur work from 2016 that looked at uh, the amount of plastic production that we were kind of producing back then globally, we're at 316 million tonnes, 40% going to landfill, 32% escaping into the natural environment, 14% being recycled, but of that 14 um, only 2% is kind of what we call properly circular, that's PET and HD. Um, 8% being downcycled, that's mostly your polyorphans, so the most highly littered stuff. Um, and then 14% is, is waste to energy. So all of that to say that an issue that big with that degree of systematic complexity, um, we can't afford to be in fiefdoms. We can't afford to not collaborate. Um, and when polymateria was set up, we deliberately were designed to be materially agnostic. So regardless if you are a bioplastic or synthetic-based resin, the thing that we were obsessed about as a scientific team back in the day was how do you solve for the 32%? So focused on the polyorphans, which is polypropylene and polyethylene, which is 31% of the 32% winding up in the natural environment. How do you solve for that without impacting on recycling? So to help the roundtables later on this evening, I was, I was just going to talk about two key things this evening. Um, one is a philosophy called um, good cycling. And um, to, I think, maybe step back from the materials that you're using for a second and, and talk about good cycling within context, it's quite simple, actually. It's how does everything ultimately need to return to nature? So how do we only work mater with materials that are pure? So it's quite obviously, and you'll hear from Rodrigo a little bit later, who's you know, a fantastic example of being able to take uh, not PLA and, and, uh, and, 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 and eat it and consume it, um, but how do you also work with other materials that are safe for return to nature? Interestingly, going back to that 31% that winds up in nature, polyorphans are actually a good candidate for return to nature. They're not toxic, um, and in particular, if you're working with, with additives and, and materials in them, you can actually use um, polyorphans as a, as a good candidate for what we kind of call good cycling. So that was the, if you want, the lens by which Polymateria created our technology, which is called biotransformation. And really it was about looking at how you can successfully biodegrade the most highly littered forms of plastic without creating microplastic, without harming the natural environment in any way, and also um, without impacting on recycling. So this is the, I guess, the overarching um, um, graphic that, that you know, we try to use to describe it, which talks about the biological cycle. So when Bill McDonough wrote Cradle to Cradle all those years ago, he always envisaged the fact that things need to return to nature. The biological cycle, nature is the most powerful circular economy we have. But the technical cycle that lives within it, ideologically, in our rush to kind of embrace it and design circularity in there, we've, we've forgot to design a system that ultimately allows things to return back into nature. And the key to that is really twofold. It's firstly working with materials that are pure um, and also, and this is one of the key dimensions to, to biotransformation, it's time controlling exactly when your technology is triggered to give the technical cycle that should live within it every chance to happen. And that's super important when it comes to engaging with consumers because consumers will talk a little bit later about their, I think, confusion and inertia and, and the gap between thought and action and everything else. But if you are able to time control the onset of a biodegradable technology, you can allow for supply chain, allow for the in-use phase, allow for the end-of-life phase, and then ideally it goes back into either the polyorphans loop or the PET loop or, or some other loop and then it becomes something else. But if for whatever reason then it becomes part of the 32% and it winds up back in the natural environment, you're not creating microplastic, you're not creating any ecotox issues, well then ultimately that is um, what Bill had always envisaged when he wrote um, Cradle to Cradle. So this is a little poem that Bill wrote when he came to visit us a few weeks ago 
which talks about this concept of oil to soil. Now, this is, I, I, I'm not sure who's, who's in the room with me here tonight, but demonizing plastic and, and the populist, I think, um, reaction to plastic pollution is something we never had in the early days when we were trying to drive climate action. But we have massive awareness on, on um, plastic pollution at the moment. We don't necessarily have the same degree of, of, of science-based approaches and collaboration that we now have in place on climate change with things like the IPCC and Nick Stern and all of the, um, the cops that are, that are in place. But hopefully that's where we'll get to over the next couple of years. But Bill, when he um, came to visit and he looked at the materials we're working with and we looked at the approach, he talked about this concept of oil to soil. Bill is, for those of you who know, much more poetic than me when it comes to giving presentations like this, but he, he said that this was always something he envisaged would happen because within Cradle to Cradle, he talks about polyorphans as being this pure material that can return to nature. And he says, quote, unquote, I always knew one day someone would figure it out. I didn't know um, about the time-controlled aspect and, and giving that technical cycle every chance to happen. I didn't, I didn't think anybody would ever manage to, to, to kind of discover that. So this is a little... A uh, poem that Bill wrote to kind of commemorate his, his visit to us. But really what he went on to kind of talk about that day was in embracing the whole concept of good cycling, you have to filter out the materials that you're using so that anything toxic that could be in there, like um, polystyrene or BPA or anything else, that's your first filter. So your first filter being working with only pure materials. And that allows you to think about how return to, to nature can, can be achieved. But our, I think our ideological approach to the circular economy has suffered from a lot of this, which is people who are working with hazardous materials, with toxic su substances like polystyrene, like BPA, have thought that it's okay to just close the loop on those materials. But in a world with restricted resources, restricted infrastructure, and also just restricted political equity and buy-in to things, we have to be very honest about toxic materials not having a role within, within life and within society, and things like that just need to be banned. There's no point wasting time closing the loop on polystyrene, BPA, and other toxic materials. As Bill says, that, that is what we would call bad cycling. So we have two very different philosophies, the concept of good cycling, allowing things to return to nature, giving the technical cycle every chance to happen, but the key is working with only pure materials. The question then is how do you communicate all of this to consumers? Because I'd imagine this is a very technical room, but, you know, Mrs. Miggins uh, up in Leeds, who just needs to know what she does differently at the end of the day, would be very confused, I'd imagine, by, by all of this. So there... I'm going to draw on a little piece of research that was done by the World Economic Forum back in 2015, which used neuroscience to analyze the gap between thought and action. Why do we think one thing and do another? And the outcomes of that were really profound, quite, quite simple actually. But if you do engage with consumers in an empowering way, whereby they can see that their actions are actually going to contribute to a, to a bigger whole, and you're incredibly simple. In particular, if you cut through this, the eco-labeling jungle. So we do not need, need to stick another green leaf on something. We do not need another green stamp. All of the neuroscience said they're incredibly turned off by that. They do understand perishability. Everybody understands if produce is going off on a Wednesday, you're cleaning the fridge out on a Thursday. So use by dates with a time-controlled aspect, and our technology gives you the ability to introduce perishability to packaging. So that's why we created and trademarked something called Recycle By, which is the whole concept of communicating to the consumer the one action you want them to take, which is ultimately uh, recycling the materials, but by a particular date to allow for the 32%. So you have a situation where the consumer can do their bit, the brands can do their bit, but for some reason it may not be littering, the system fails. We know recyclers are struggling to cope with volumes, so it gets sent off to Malaysia, it winds up on an island with our technology in there, then at least we have a solution. So this whole um, movement, if you want, is, is called Recycle By, and this is the second thing I wanted to kind of put out on the, on the table this evening, which is how are we empowering consumers and putting them at the heart of new innovations and disruptive approaches? And what have we learned about the right way to engage consumers and the wrong way to engage consumers? So we've, we've launched this. We are, I was saying to Rodrigo before I came up on stage, we are a B2B brand. So we spend a lot of our time communicating a hell of a lot of science and 
many of you, like uh, Paula Chin and others who've been to the lab, understand the science that sits behind us, but it's not enough. It's not enough just to be a disruptive technology. You have to disrupt the broader system. So we've worked with brands, worked with celebrity advocates, worked with various people to go out and do very, very same as what Rodrigo is, is doing, which is put the technology in the hands of consumers through grassroots movements. Because ultimately, the brands, the converters, the resin providers are moving so slow, they're not treating this like a global emergency. So the businesses and the technologies who are going to be the most successful are going to win with grassroots. And in terms of your roundtables later on this evening, I think one thing that often gets overlooked is how do we ultimately make that happen. We're putting forward Recycle Buy as an idea. I'm sure the rest of you will come up with um, many other very practical actions on that front as well. So I'm timing out at this stage. I'm, I was given uh, 10 minutes. Um, conscious that we may miss each other, we may not all get to talk to the round table. So please do let me know what you think about good cycling, what you think about Recycle Buy through your round tables and otherwise. I'd, I'd really love to see and hear any feedback that you have. And feel free to engage with me either um, later on this evening or um, uh, through all the social media channels that are up there.